We are here at Metalworks Studios, and the last time we spoke to Jordan Gibbons, you were in town, and you were doing a little country night, and we had a chance to talk to you a little bit about your music, but a lot has gone on since then. First of all, what are you doing here in Toronto at Metalworks Studios? Oh, man. Gil War- Gilmore was so kind to open up his studio to us and let us record a couple songs in here over the next couple days, so... We're getting drums sounding good right now, and we're about to record like two songs. So we're excited. When you were in school, did they get you to make macaroni cards? Macaroni cards? Yes. I don't think so. Okay, this is going somewhere. We're just (laughs) going to take the long route. Not ten to. Macaroni necklaces. Okay. (laughs) Here's where this is going. Macaroni cards are where they get construction paper. And then you stick like noodles in the shape of a heart and you say, I love you, daddy or mommy. You're the best dad. Here's how this relates to you. Part of the reason why you're here is because Gilmore is an absolute insane Jays fan. Right? Yes. Yes. Though I hear. (laughs) So because of your daddy, Mm -hmm. you're able to record in one of Canada's premier recording studios. Here's how this applies. When Father's Day comes around next year. No macaroni cards. <laughs> no macaroni cards. You got to get dad something good. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I know. And I, yeah, something something really good for sure. Like? Hmm. What would Gibby like for Father's Day? He's the hardest person to shop for because I think he's more of like sentimental, which might surprise some people. But this past Father's Day... Um, one of my brothers downloaded a bunch of pictures and made a little book for him. And, um, he loved that. Yeah. He, that stuff like that is be still my heart (laughs) is what he's, he loves. (laughs) It's funny you say that because I think it was you a few months back on Facebook found some video of your dad hitting a home run in a New York Mets uniform. And this thing almost went viral. Were you surprised at how the reaction was to people seeing your dad in in a tight little Mets uniform. (laughs) Actually, you know what? I have never seen actual footage of my dad playing. So that was really the first time I'd ever seen video of him. I just found it on Facebook. Somebody else had posted it. And, uh, of course, I had to share it. And, um, yeah, it kind of blew up. Everyone loved it. I don't think they could believe that was him (laughs) hitting that home run but he yeah if most people I don't know if most people know but yeah he spent a lot of time catching with the Mets organization and grew up through that and by the time I was born he was already into coaching so it was a nice little treasure to find well it's a cool thing I mean I know the Blue Jays have a lot of young players whose fathers played professional baseball and I've asked them this and, and I'm curious to know your opinion on this at what point in your life did you realize that your dad was a big deal beyond being the big deal of he's my daddy? I think, let's see. Well, because when I was growing up, um, we spent a lot of time in the, the minor leagues and that was just kind of the, the thing. It's, oh, my dad goes to the park and uh, we go to the baseball field at night and that was just our life. And I don't think it was until like, seventh grade when I think he got his first managing position with the Jays and we saw him on ESPN and we're like okay that's pretty cool like (laughs) I think that's when it kind of clicked like hey dad's on TV this is this is pretty cool (laughs) so while we're on the topic of your dad and then we'll get to some music because we are here for your music yeah but but we got to talk about dad too we do we do I love him so I have two things so last year we had one of our listeners uh, emailed a question in and said, he asked us if there was, um, sorry, no, they asked about our wives. If there was one Blue Jay that, that our wives could run away with. Oh, you're not going to, well, maybe you will want to hear this, Jordan. <laughs> Who would it be? So of course, you know, it's always Josh Donaldson and when Jose Bautista Kevin was there. Pilar got Kevin some Pilar, votes, right? Yeah. All the really like, come on, like, like the GQ looking guys. Oh, yeah. So I asked my wife, my wife said... <laughs> John Gibbons. And the reason why she said John Gibbons is, you know, he always, he sort of has this little walk that he does when he walks out to the mound and he always looks very nice. He's always standing up for his players. He looks like he would be just a wonderful human 
as well as a wonderful husband. So if you could pass this message on to your father that my wife has a serious crush. I'm sure Gibby's going to listen to this interview yeah. now. Yeah. And yeah. he may spill his beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, is there a Texan dictionary that, that you guys can supply us with? Because sometimes when your father says things, we, we, and, you know, everybody in Canada looks at each other and said, what did you just say? For instance, it's nut cutting time. What is nut cutting time? That is a very good question. Oh, okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Sometimes he'll say these things. I'm, I got to scratch my head like, what? <laughs> because, I mean, even last year, he was he comes running out as fast as Gibby can run out to see, you know, an ump. There was a big skirmish. And he says, you've been out all night. And that swept through Toronto like wildfire. And it was more like, you've been out all night. You know what your dad sounds oh, yeah. like, right? That was so, not a good impersonation no, was terrible. of your dad. But, but the point is, is there is there a Texan dictionary? Can you guys supply us with something so that we can better understand what the heck your father's talking about? Yeah, you might need a translator, a dictionary, <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah, because it's, he like talks in code sometimes too, I think. It's very difficult sometimes. <laughs> Jordan, being a baseball manager is probably one of the most stressful jobs you can have. It can be very fulfilling. There's not a lot of job security in it. Were you surprised that your dad jumped back into it after taking the time off? Because I think a lot of people were surprised that he was coming back to Toronto. But I looked at it and go, why does Gibby want to go back and do this again? And like, you know him better than we do. Why did he want to come back and do this again? He loves Toronto and he always has. And it was, and we have, to, we do too. Me and my brothers grew up here and love the city, love the people. And um, I think just baseball's in his blood and he had to get back up there and give it one more shot. And we're so glad he did. They went on a nice little couple year playoff run and um, it's been fun. This is like our second home up here and, and he's, he loves it. So fantastic. Okay. Music. Music. First question for you. So for those just jumping in, listeners, we are at Metalwork Studio here in Mississauga, Ontario, probably one of the most premier recording studios in all of the country. And thoughts on seeing something like this, Jordan? Oh, man. you When you walk in the door, you can definitely feel just the energy in here. It's amazing. And of course, you walk in and you see all those records hanging on the wall of people I've grown up listening to and watching. So um, it's definitely surreal to be recording in here for sure. You know, your dad is a huge Triumph fan. I don't imagine you knew a heck of a lot about Triumph <laughs> before. Are you now like going on Wikipedia and learning as much as you can about Gil and the rest of the band? Oh yeah. He's been a Triumph uh, fan for years. I know that he's seen them a couple times down in Texas and has always followed them. And so, yeah, I, and I always knew some of their stuff growing up, but I definitely, um, did some research too. And just, uh, to get the whole backstory and, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. We all know that your dad is made love music, but he's not the musical guy, most musical guy in the world. I've never heard him sing. And I don't know if I want oh, to hear him sing, baby. <laughs> oh, but, baby. but the question is, <laughs> when did this become a passion for you when did you like were you just a little kid when you just started singing around the house how did it all start for you yeah from as long as I can remember I've always loved music always loved performing we used to put on little shows for you know my parents and and we always had music playing around the house so my dad loves his rock and roll he loves his country he just blares it through the house and um you know, watches old concerts on YouTube all the time. And um, so I think I got my love of music from him. And it wasn't until college where I finally picked up the guitar and tried to... So late. That yeah, was a, that was late. Yeah, later. Yeah, wow. definitely a new endeavor. Um, but I had always wanted to play guitar and had some more time on my hands with only taking 15 hours and uh, in college and taught myself how to play. And that turned into writing songs, um, which turned into fronting a band. And Very nice. It's kind of just all unfolded.
let's say your father was a lawyer and you would go to dad and say, dad, listen, I'm considering pursuing a career in music, but your dad being a professional, a lawyer would be like, well, why don't you go for something a little bit more secure? My thought would be that if your father is a professional baseball manager, it would be a lot easier for a son or daughter to come to him and say, dad, I think I want to pursue a career in music. He would be able to understand better because it's not a very secure job as well as it's very niche, right? Like there's not many people being super successful at it. Do you feel like your dad's job would have predisposed him to being more understanding with your choice of career? Oh yeah. He's like my number one supporter and it is, it's, it's stressful because there is no security in it, you know, and there's no guarantees. And um, what's great about my dad is he's always been a dreamer and uh, he's always just really encouraged me like, hey, if this is what you love to do, like be happy doing it. And God, I love your dad. <laughs> be smart too. You know, like you got to, I'm a substitute teacher or I have my teaching degree. And so I'll do that during the week to, you know, pay the bills and all that good stuff. But um. So definitely be smart about it, but hey, life is long and you got to love what, late, lo luckily it's long and you got to enjoy what you're doing, you know, you get one life to live. So he's a big um, encourager of that. You said you taught yourself how to play guitar. Guitar is not an easy instrument to teach yourself how to play. And I know from all the years of playing that there's this hump that you need to get over. It can frustrate you to the point where you say, I'm enough, right? You learn, you know, a couple little things here and there, but you just can't get over the hump. How did you get yourself over that hump by teaching yourself? Yeah, it really wasn't until, you know, you got to build up those calluses on your fingers because you want to cry <laughs> at first. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's such an awkward, like, hand position. I remember that was the hardest thing at first. Like, And no thumb over the bridge, right? Right, yeah. like learning how to, like, position your hand. And um, yeah, it, it's one of those things. It took a lot of practice, but it almost didn't seem like practice because I really was enjoying it. Um, but yeah, once you hit that, like, couple month mark and you kind of uh, hit that learning curve, um, it kind of started to make sense and I wish I could do all the lead cool lead guitar stuff I can't do that I can do like the you know rhythm stuff I know you know but that's where chords, it's at though yeah that's like all people really don't <laughs> people don't give the rhythm guitarist credit right yeah. but that's where it's at that's what gives the sh that song like that and the bass guitar give the song the bounce right if you don't have a good rhythm guitarist it sounds like not having a good rhythm guitar. Totally. Right? So then tell us about the songwriting process. So you've learned how, how to play guitar on your own. You're now writing your own songs. Then you bring in other musicians. And I know for me being, being a professional musician, the song comes into a writing session in one form and generally leaves in a completely different form three hours later. Tell us about how you write and how you write differently, let's say, with, with the band in mind. Yeah, lately I've been trying to do some more co-writes just to get new ideas, fresh ideas that you never would have come up with on your own. So that's definitely a new territory that I'm exploring and I'm enjoying exploring that. Um, but every time is different. Sometimes I'll get a line in my head or have a title and go off of that or sometimes I'll hear a melody. A lot of times it's lyrics and chords coming out at the same time um our lead guitarist dana he's um we've recently started to write together as well and a lot of times he'll come up with some cool licks that we'll create a song off of so it's, it's all kind of different each time one of the big differences between writing a pop song and writing a country song is you know, as as Matt can attest to being a big fan of uh, Backstreet Boys. Love it. Lyrics <laughs> lyrics are completely irrelevant, but country is all about telling stories. And a lot of times these stories are true life stories. When you write lyrics, are they in many ways about your life? Or do you just pick out things and just write about make-believe characters? Yeah, that's one of the things I love about country music it's like you said all about the story um i personally find it easier to write when i've lived through it and i can relate to it 
I try sometimes to, for exercises, to write about things that maybe I haven't lived through. Um, but I feel like the songs I connect to most are obviously the ones that I've been through. And we recently just went to Nashville um, to play a couple gigs. And, you know, that's the storytelling that's, that's the mecca. <laughs> capital, you know. And yeah. it was just such a treat to get to see songwriters and their elements, you know, doing what they do best. But So the one thing that I always think about asking female artists in particular especially female songwriters. I have a daughter who's two, so I haven't experienced this yet. But if you're writing a breakup song or a song where you've been jilted by, let's Not say... Not that anyone in their right mind would no, ever want to jilt. Yes, you have to here. be some kind of a doofish, okay? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, and your father eventually is going to hear some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. For me, if I was to project myself into that situation, I would be listening as your father and thinking... He did what <laughs> to you? <laughs> I'm going to get me some guys with some pipes and we're going medieval, right? Do, do you find that you have to, if you're writing a song of that nature, do you have to temper some of the stuff so that when it does get released into the public, you're not worried about someone like your dad or your brother or whatever going like, we're going to find Brian and <laughs> he's dead. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's such a, you know, vulnerable thing, songwriting. You're kind of just putting it all out there for the world to hear. And um, yeah, it's yes, I feel like sometimes I edit myself. I try not to, you know, because those are the best songs when you just let it all out there. But um, yeah, instead of pipes, my dad's got his baseball bat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So he doesn't need to hire anybody. He just yeah. He's got it covered. (laughs) Thank you.